Thank you very much, and I'm delighted and honored to be here to talk to you about um, a subject matter that is, I, I think, quite rele relevant. It's about values and civilizations and whether or not we actually, can you hear me? Whether or not we actually do live in a world right now of the clash of civilizations that some people would like to call it and I've been running away with this notion of the clash of civilizations since 1994 when the late Sam Huntington wrote an article about the clash of civilizations and then proceeded to write a book about it and said the world is actually leading to uh, something called uh, civilization clashes based on religion. Unfortunately, while this may be a very catchy subject, and you look at the world today and you see all these clashes and religious this, religious that, and crazies running around hijacking religions and claiming that they speak the, the true religion of their uh, particular faith, that the world may indeed may ha may be heading in the direction of uh, clash of civilizations based on religion. Well, Sam Huntington measured nothing. It was a very nice story, a very catchy story, and it's, it wasn't the first time he wrote something like that. He's written many very interesting books, some of them very good, um, but this one, for those of us who study societies based on very complex surveys, and I'm part of this study worldwide called the World Values Survey, which I'll share with you in, in a couple of minutes what it is. We now have 35 years of data measuring pure changing values, attitudes and beliefs in over 94 countries and territories around the world every five years, led by experts of those countries who work together and we literally go through every question with a fine comb to make sure the wording is appropriate for the locale we are working in. It's not the same survey, same wording everywhere. It has to capture the cultural nuances. And now we have data that we can look at and analyze and actually say, do we really have a clash of civilizations? Or what is happening here? Well, to make this long story short, Huntington said, and this is the largest we can get this screen, so I'm sorry. Uh, there's nothing I can do about that. But the world is basically Orthodox, Muslim, Protestant, and he basically said the Chinese culture, African cultures, becoming something like that. And he identified some border countries, and he zeroed in on Turkey, right there, torn between east and west, he never quite said south and west. Um, and that countries like that, even though they're trying to pull away from their religious backgrounds, will eventually fall right back into it and with major turbulence. Well, we're seeing that in Turkey today. So, but what about the clash of civilizations? He said these are the emergent conflicts as you can see with Western, African, Hindu, Sinic, that's China, Orthodoxy, Japanese, Latin America, and the darker the lines connecting these cultures, the greater the likelihood of conflict. Okay. Well, is this really what we're seeing because it's natural? Or is the conflict we're observing today 
due to some ill-perceived policies of certain governments. That has nothing to do with civilizations. And look, if you go around the world and you start tearing apart countries and you leave behind a mess, what kind of reaction are you going to get? Of course you're going to get nasty reactions. How do we account for popularity of the United States in Turkey in 1999 versus today? In 1999, a goodwill gesture by the then President Clinton after the major earthquake led to a major increase in uh, positive view of the US, upwards of 94%. And today, it's at the lowest level in the entire Muslim world. It's about 5%. Now, that is due to the wildfire that's consuming the region and all the headache it's creating in the country, and also the challenges creating and misperceptions within the country about the rise of fundamentalism versus uh, secularism and whether or not the United States, true or not, plays any role in it. When we look at values, if you Google world values surveys, you will go to an incredibly rich web page. And all of our data are available for you to use. And those of you who may be interested in playing around with variables like religiosity, and attitudes towards this or that. Whether or not people would like to have neighbors of this character or that character or different religious background, nationalities, tolerance against their socioeconomic level, level of education or religious background. You can download and play that data online. It's interactive. And you may see some differences and you may also see a lot of similarities. When we do an analysis of per capita income and index over here on um, well-being of individuals, subjective, we're asking them What do you say, what can you tell me about your well-being? Are you doing well, moderately well, or you're in dire need of help? And against the income level, we see that, well, it's no brainer. The developed rich countries are here. And the higher the income level, that the better they feel. That's just one thing. This is what is very important. There are two indexes or indices in this data set that measure on the one level religiosity and secularism, and another level it measures selfishness against post-materialist values. Each one is based on a set of 12 questions. It's not just one question. And we call, refer to that as the growth of human development. This is self-expression values, and this is secular and more religious values. And by religious, it's not just a question whether or not you believe in God. Because 99% says yes. But church, mosque, synagogue attend attendance, observance of religious holidays, observance of the canon law. Uh, and in addition to that, we ask questions like, should clergy be consulted regarding family problems or political policies or economic issues and so forth? You add them all up and you devise this index, it captures 
the two of them together, about 85 to 90 percent of variation in human values around the world. And this is why I'm showing it to you. When we do it, we see a map like this. These are countries. And as you see, they start grouping together. Values are here the Islamic world, South Asia, Orthodoxy, Confucian, Catholic Europe, Latin America, different than Catholic Europe. English-speaking world, the rest of the Protestant world. And what we see here is self-expression, post-materialist values versus um, I need to survive myself first values. The way I can explain that to you is like, remember when you talk to grandfathers about development projects, and you're sensitive about trees and cutting down trees, and he would say, but humans come first. Environment comes second. That's a selfish survivalist value. It's about putting the self above everything else. And now here we are sitting in this post-materialist Portland, and we worry about clean air, clean water, safe environment. They call us tree huggers. Uh, those who get offended by it move away. They go to Idaho. Uh, I had some friends who actually told me that. That's why I'm sharing that with you. They said, I, I can't handle all these tree huggers. I, I, I'm moving. Um, and all these regulations, why do we do that? Because we have learned bad lessons. When I first went to Michigan in 1979 to, to do my doctorate, I said, wonderful, a lot of lakes here, I'll go fishing. Every single lake I went to had a sign, don't fish here, PCB poisoning. So the industrializa industrialization, this push for rapid growth, in that process, we poisoned our environment. And then we turned around and spent billions and billions of dollars to clean it up. When Eastern European countries joined the European Union in 2004, well, even before that, when they were getting ready to join, I was part of uh, studies that looked at what these countries are like. They were devastated. They were literally living in poisonous environments. And now the job was to clean it up. Because at the time, their communist regime was emphasizing heavy industrialization, rapid growth at the expense of what we would call post-industrialist awareness. You couldn't even discuss it. Self-expression for all of the young people in this room is very important. Why do you have cell phones and tablets and you talk to your friends and all that stuff? It's very important for you. And the day the government comes and says, no more internet is the end of the world. Correct? Yes. And we saw that in Turkey a year ago during Gezi Park demonstrations. Self-expression, extremely important. That's another post-industrial value. On the other side is religiosity and secularism. And again, that is built on a large scale of 12 questions. A couple of years ago, a student of mine and I were looking at all the reasons why European Union was rejecting, not quite out coming out and saying, Turkey, please withdraw your application for membership, but we'll put it on the back burner or deep freezer, even better. So we're looking at all the reasons. And, you know, people are saying, uh, Turks are Muslims, therefore the Europeans don't want them. It's Islamophobia. Well, it's a fashionable word these days. True or not, it depends where you are. Most of the problem in Europe, and I'm an expert on European Union, I've been studying it for 26 years, written many books on it. It's about economics. It's about power. It's about cost. At one time, 
Commissioner Günther Verhugen, who was in charge of enlargement for the EU in 2004, and we were negotiating the Anand Peace Plan for Cyprus, and I was advisor of the US State Department, literally over drinks, as I was pushing him about whether or not Turkey is actually a genuine candidate or a make-believe candidate, he said, look, it has nothing to do with who they are, it's about the cost. He said, bringing Turkey into the European Union is unlike any other enlargement. This 12 country enlargement we were looking at in Eastern Europe is dwarf next to Turkey. It's like bringing a continent into the EU. And if you look at the power sharing in the European Union institutions, Turkey will be as large as Germany. It will have as many votes in the Council of Ministers as Germany. It will have as many seats in the European Parliament. It will be a big player, big player. And over time, Germany is declining in population. In fact, entire Europe is sinking. I have some bubble charts that I showed to my class. What is the expected trajectile of the giants in the world, as I call it? And it, it's time will be here, economic might there, and the size of the bubble is per capita productivity. United States very high, Europe very high, but they're falling. They fall over time like this, and Europe much faster than the United States, and China increases in 20 years will have a larger economy than the United States. So we do some what ifs. You add this country or that country to European Union in the future years and you do some estimations. Doesn't matter if how many small countries you have, they're midgets, they're tiny. And I don't mean to be offensive. Even Poland is a tiny country in the larger picture. The last enlargement of the European Union increased the population of Europe, EU, by one third. So it's over half a billion EU citizens now. And it only increased its economy by 3%. And worse, the rich Europe is declining because it's getting older. More people have to work to sustain it. It's not sustainable. Europe can only grow, and the trajectiles show that, and we shared it with Commission, and guess what? They were doing the same studies and found the same results, but nobody wants to talk about it. Um, Europe doesn't reverse its decline unless countries like Turkey and Ukraine join. Ah, well, what about Islamic fear? Turks are different. Not all Turks are different. If you go to Istanbul, Western Turkey, you're a different world than then you are in Southeastern Turkey. Turkey is as mixed as any other country. Um, when they try to write a constitution for Europe, everybody who is very deep in their religiosity, like Poland is here, this red is Turkey, conservative and survivalist. The rest of the Europe is moving in this direction, more secular and more self-expression. So there are some value differences. And if you look at all the polls in Turkey, it's probably 50-50 right now. Um, there is nothing in the European Union's laws that says this is simply a Christian club. It's illegal, in fact can't use it as such. Now Europe, in terms of its practice of religiosity as institutions of countries, they come in 31 flavors. Some countries are very strict and some of you from North Africa are familiar with the term laicite, laicism, which is different than Anglo-American secularism. And others have identified official religions of the state, and some have three. Both all Christian, but three. Okay. In France, state dominates religious institutions. It's the French model of laicite. That's what Turkey is like, and that's all the clashes. Um, religious, uh, this is very hard to see. What I wanted to show you was the 
Um, latest figures we have from 2011, and these are all the Islamic countries we have data on, and how um, religious they are on the average. And the ones who are right here in, in, in the middle are mixed, uh, more independence over here, more secular, and more obedience to religious faith over here. And post-Soviet countries are the most secular in the Muslim world. Turkey is smack in the middle. Or is Turkey right there? Smack in the middle. Egypt. Right here is in the middle. 42% right smack in the middle of the uh, scale. 35 over here and um, 15 over here and 32 over here. Tunisia, similar. Uh, Morocco, again like that. So when people look, look at the Muslim world and say, well, all the Muslims are radicals and, and very conservative, that's not the case at all. This data clearly shows the wide range of religiosity. And we see it like this. Economic development in a country, let me just stop one second and say, share something else with you. When I talked about the future challenges of the countries and the increase and decline of their relative economic wealth, Middle Eastern countries are not in the picture. They're not even in the ballpark. They're flat smack at the bottom. And the reason for that are, there are several reasons. Their economies are not diversified. Those that are relying on single export items and make a lot of money from oil don't share it. Have a have lot more of the income than the have-nots. Population growth rate is higher, which means the lower income levels are increasingly increasing in numbers. And that's adding to the problems the societies face. And also leads to hopelessness among the younger generations. And we find that by asking, when I control for demographics, and ask the question, how happy are you? Sometimes you hear in the news that the Danes are the happiest people in the world, or the Dutch. One day a, a journalist called me from Texas about it, and he saw my name on world value surveys, and what, what do you have to say about this? I said, well, what are you talking about? So well, the, the Dutch are the happiest people. I said, ah, you're talking about the value survey. Yep, they are the happiest people. Why? Several items, it's not just how happy you feel, but what makes you feel happy? Financial security. How happy are you with your financial situation? How happy are you with your health? How happy are you with your family? How happy are you with the, your environment? What about, does the government leave you alone? Things of that sort adds to this index of happiness. In the Middle East, generally, happiness is very low, and there are they have reasons for that. On top of these issues they have with their own governments, they have wars. Some of them imposed upon them. And then we leave and leave behind a huge mess. Well, when we look at it, prosperity goes with economic dimension. That's a no-brainer. But is economic progress or growth simply sufficient to go to democracy? This is an important question because a lot of people believe that if you simply increase the wealth, wealth and democracy come together. They don't. Before you go to democracy, and there are many ways democracy is measured, by the way. I'll tell you in a second. 
Values change, but and value changes happen slowly. They can't change overnight. When we impose value changes overnight, we only create imbalances in a society, and that society starts falling apart. It takes a generation or two for things to settle down and then move forward. Um, and the values change in the direction of more self-expression. Got bad news for governments, I really do. If they think they can control the you know, emergent youth's ability for self-expression by imposing limitations and controls, it's not gonna work. It's like a silent revolution. And one bright side in, in the Turkish world that we saw after all these rises in uh, authoritarian measures of the current government is that the youth came out and shocked everybody last summer and said, don't touch my self-expression. Very similar, by the way, to what we saw in the United States and Western Europe in the late 60s and early 70s, that there was something happening and it was silent. That generation of youth had different values than their parents. It shocked the United States, shocked the Germans, shocked the British. It's happening there too, but you're not seeing it yet. Pay attention to the youth and you'll see it's there. Try to take away that Facebook account and see what happens. It's not possible. The Pandora's box is open. And it's a wonderful thing. You know why? The more we communicate with each other, the more interaction we have with each other, the better the world becomes. And that is a key. That is a key because isolation simply feeds on fears. We hear, like, look, it's, 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 no, it's no secret. There is currently Islamic fear in this country far greater to some degree than some of the European countries. Why? Well, it's all about ignorance and not interaction. And with interaction, people learn. Ignorance disappears, and you realize that we're not all that different from one another. When values are changing, they become more secular. That's not, that doesn't mean a religious. I hate that analogy that when you're secular, secular, you're not a religious person. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Self-expression, absolutely crucial. They lead to decline in corruption. Because so self-expression leads to demand for accountability, and that leads to democratic institutions. When you ask people, um, do you believe in democracy? Is democracy a good system? Everybody, 9.9 .9 out of 10 says yes. Then you start asking them, what do you mean by democracy? And it gets really, really exciting. In one study I did on five European advanced capitalist democracies and United States plus Canada, I found out that individuals, oh, this is the way we ask them, what are the essential elements of democracy? And there's a whole list of things. And you ask them to identify, check as many as possible. We realize that there's two groups. Those who measure democracy based on their pocketbook, economic gains, and those who measure it based on values, equality, tolerance, post-materialist stuff. And then we looked into something else that was very interesting. Who are pro or against immigrants and immigration policy? How many of you are, you are immigrants? I'm an immigrant, I wasn't born here. Okay. What is fascinating, that children of immigrants were more anti-immigration than their parents. 
And I said to my research colleague, who is an immigrant from Argentina down in Claremont and Yatsik, I said, you're describing my brother. And I tell my brother, but you are an immigrant. And he goes, yes, but I'm legal. I'm like, really? Get over it. I mean, especially here in this country of immigrants. <laughs> I, mean, it, it, I find it incredibly amusing that I, I sit with friends in Rotary who are like, oh, all those immigrants, and I'm sitting right next to them. And I'm like, well, you're talking about me, but you're different. Like, How am I different? Well, you're different. Hmm, okay. The job for all of us is to educate people, and we can educate them by simply living in ghettos. We gotta get involved. You gotta get into the network of the society, school boards, teachers, parents, associations, the local committees of uh, local governments, or they're all volunteer committees, and serve on them. And everybody would realize, hey, wow, okay, you may dress different than I do, but we have the basic values. In the Middle East, and the Islamic world, greater Islamic world, people by and large are more religious. Uh, are they more religious than those in the Catholic world in Latin America? Mm, no, very close. Now, we also have data on, does this mean, and I, I looked at this in, in particular because they're now associating terrorism with Islamism. Just because we have our crazies doesn't mean we, everybody is crazy. Everybody has their crazies. Now, more religious, as you're more religious in the Muslim world, you're more likely to embrace Sharia law as natural. And then I have friends who panic, especially some of my Turkish friends who immediately start seeing it as anti-secular, anti-Kemalist revolution in the making. Not quite. When you ask the same people whether or not their belief in Sharia also means they want to have theocracy, the percentage drops like a rock in a lake to about 5%, max. So what part of Sharia law is it that the Muslims in foreign countries that say that they go take second, uh, make them their, uh, their second home, desire? It's typically family law. I once asked the, my, my dear friend and mentor, colleague, uh, late Dr. Tulan, who convinced me to come here. He was telling me about that in Egypt, even the Coptic Christians voted to accept Sharia family law in the legal system. And I said, well, how did that happen? I mean, why would the Coptic Christians would favor that? And he said to me, well, you obviously don't know anything about Egypt and the Egyptian society. Then I had a long lecture. Um, and he said, it's all about property. And he went into deep discussion of what that means. Um, in some countries this flies and some countries it doesn't. Because secularist societies basically separate anything that has religious based law from secular law. And for some of us it may be a shocker, hard to adjust to, but it's part of the life. Um, and understanding of what is democracies, I think, requires a basic, deep down discussion in the Muslim world of what it really means. Because you can, in the, in the general world setting, it simply means something out of European experience. And you can trace it all the way back to the classical Greece. And that kind of democracy had slaves. Well, it's that slaves here too. It evolves over time. But with the Scottish Enlightenment, there is something called secularism that took rise, and it's going. That is much harder in the Middle East and the Muslim world. 
because our religion hasn't experienced something like reformation. And our religion has all the dictation of law, economics, etc., social behavior in one document. So is it necessary to have these discussions? Well, it's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen, whether we like it or not. It's not going to be easy, but it is going to happen. I can leave you with some good um, conclusions, and that is when we look at this 30 plus year of data around the world, I don't see any imminent clash of, that is, let me put it this way, natural clash of civilizations. They're man made. Because most people want the basic desires, and that's the list. They want to be happy. They want to have personal and financial security. They want to have a home. Everybody wants a better future for their children. And they don't want to be disturbed by government authorities. It's universal. Really universal. This may be a no-brainer, but we have data to substantiate it. So how does this clash of civilization thing comes forward? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether it's some idiotic, radical group picking up fights with everybody else and claiming that they speak for the whatever faith, you know, in the mid-90s, a typical image of a radical terrorist in, in U.S. movies was a blonde, blue-eyed idiot. Um, I remember that very well. Now it's a radical Muslim running around with a Kalashnikov or whatever, or blowing himself up. And in the United States, unfortunately, every immigrant society gets its turn, and it's our turn which we have to fight to eliminate, and we can only do that by engaging with the society, not withdrawing from it. We have to. Otherwise, we're simply letting the ignorance take hold, and ignorance becomes a monster in and of itself. Okay. The other side of the self-fulfillment story is when irresponsible governments go and blow up other countries and leave behind a mess. And it's our job to hold them accountable for that as well. And I think it's going to happen eventually. There are more and more people opening their eyes and be like, what the heck have we done in the Middle East? One country after another, and now it is an unbelievable mess. And I'm sorry, we are, we are responsible for that. And that creates hatred, anger, da 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 in the Middle East. That doesn't mean clash of civilization. That's not natural. It didn't happen naturally. It happened because we messed it up for whatever reason. And we as uh, a society need to hold those responsible accountable, period. And I know everybody's listening and recording us and all that and blah, blah, blah. Well, we also, I'm happy to believe that I live in a country I can speak my mind and know my rights. So, um, I look forward to working with you. As Waishdi said, I'm the incoming director of Middle East Studies Center. We're going to pick up the pieces and move forward. This center is an eminent center in the United States higher academia. And I don't say that lightly. It's one of the first centers in the United States created, established at a university. When Portland State was not even a university yet. And that means a lot. Uh, we will work with the communities, plural, all the communities from the Middle East. Um, we will work with alumni, we'll work with, we'll reach out to universities, centers in 
in the Middle East and sign agreements for collaboration. I just came back from Turkey a couple of few months ago. We signed five agreements for dual degrees and student exchanges. Looks very promising. Like to do that in other countries and move forward. So I hope we can work together and the community can help us with the Middle East Studies Center as well. And I thank you again for inviting me to speak to you. Yes. The first one asked about the Turkey being the leader. Which world? Turkey being the Islamic or Muslim world leader. You elaborate and talk about that this is becoming that leader with the Muslim world model. Second, my second question is kind of comment about it now since you talked about the middle. Uh, there are there are works written using this data about that. In fact, as soon as Huntington, he passed away, wrote it, the president of this study, World Value Survey, who happens to be one of my former professors at Michigan, published a book thrashing the clash of civilizations. Nobody paid attention. <laughs> Because it's not sexy to talk about harmony, but it's very sexy to talk about clash and, and whatever. I'm sorry for putting it in those terms, but it's the reality. About Turkey, nobody asked Turkey to become the leader or, or, or the role model for the Middle East. Um, and that, that's a Western thing. Um, and I don't pay much attention to those things. I really don't. Um, because... If you look at the, there's a tendency in the World Bank and places like that, and I lost this. Um, anyway, they always come up with a model for something. Five years later, everybody forgets. Now I can give you all this, or all these Korean model, this model, that model. And as far as Turkey, Turkey right now is a mess. It's a real mess. I have never seen, I studied Turkish politics since 1977. And I have never seen the society so polarized. And it's polarized by external and internal forces. And the media plays into it, feeds it. And the polarization has reached a point of secular Islamist divide. That's one. And the other equally polarized divide is Turkish Kurdish nationalisms. And these two cleavages, if you will, threaten to tear this society apart. And unfortunately, the government, instead of coming out and embracing everybody and saying, let's create a harmonious national union, is fitting it. Uh, so that people started talking about us versus them. In open discussions, it's us, them. And you hear it in talk shows when they're debating. That's not healthy. Not healthy at all. That is not a good model for anybody in the Middle East. This is, yeah, this country has been polarized. Yes, more so than, well, uh, the Vietnam years was bad. That era was bad. I caught the tail end of that. I've been in the States since I was 14 years old. And when I went to college first, a lot of my classmates were Vietnam veterans. And I remember the divide in the society. Um, then it went away. Now we have divide again. And it's getting polarized and it's fed by media. Do you, do you guys listen to talk radio? I call it hate radio. They're just feeding hate. But it's not the 
majority, this, the silent majority is here and many other gatherings around this country. And it's, it's for you, your responsibility to um, own up to it. Otherwise, you leave the arena open for idiots to take advantage of it. Any other questions? Thank you very much.